mental health is a challenge that we need to accept, not ignore. Accept the challenge. If we accept any other challenge that's presented in front of us, mental health is no different. So let's face the challenge individually, but understand that we're facing that challenge collectively. Yes, welcome back to Sister Circle Live. Yeah, we can clap for that. Yeah. We can yeah. clap for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's been about three weeks since we lost the, le the legendary Kobe mm. Bryant. We as a society have been collectively trying to gather strength to move forward. Yes, but now is the time to address the issues and challenges when it comes down to mental health and use them as a source of strength. Mm -hmm. Here to provide some insight is psychologist Dr. Alduan Tart. Welcome back to the circle. We love Dr. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, yes. We're so happy to have you yeah. yes. so that you can break some things down for yes. us as folks, regular people in society who are still continuing to mourn uh, this loss. You know, we just saw the piece, um, the soundbite from Kobe Bryant, how he wanted to fight that stigma of anxiety and, and mental health awareness. Um, as black men, how do we or how do we allow them to dispel that whole weakness thing when it comes to seeking help for their mental uh, awareness or anxiety? I mean, when you think about uh, mental, that's your mind. We are, we are humans. We have emotion. Without emotion, we're not real. We're yeah. cyborgs, we're robots, we're laptops. Our phones have no emotion. So as men, we have to be able to express our emotion. What people don't know is that the NBA has a team of doctors that actually works with each, all the rookies on being able to express their emotions. Mm. Nice. Because they know what you don't talk about masters you, but mm -hmm. what you can talk about, you master. Mm -hmm. So that's toxic masculinity Ooh, that's when it comes to not talking about how you feel. We have feelings. We feel sad. We feel anxious. We feel depressed. We feel excited. We feel challenged. We feel bored. And being able to have access to those emotions makes us human and it's something that every parent must teach their sons. It's called emotion, emotion coaching. We do a lot in mm. marriage therapy where husbands say, I don't know what to say. And then you give them a list and they say, okay, I feel disrespected. I feel sad. <laughs> uh -huh. I feel embarrassed. I, I feel emasculated. Once you give them the vocabulary, then they're able to communicate their Got emotions, it. which allows you to have oh, wow. good successful That's relationships. Good. That's, That's good. good. Stuff. When I heard the news of Kobe's I death, know. I mean, for me, I, I, I was just heartbroken. You know, I never met him in, in person at, at all, but I was just heartbroken that someone of his magnitude who was just gone so soon. You say that there's two ways that we were traumatized. Can you expound on them? I mean, one is secondary trauma. It's where you expose the people that did know Kobe and we're watching them grieve. And so we're watching this not only on TV, but all in our Instagram mm -hmm. feeds, our yeah. Facebook feeds. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we're seeing it over and over and over again. And what's happening is making us think about our own loss. Mm -hmm. Now, Kobe is a celebrity. When we think about the other people that lost their lives and people that, that we are close to have lost their lives, it's, it's making us feel that oh, way. Yeah. Let's go back to that point. Yeah, the second one is vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where, this is uh, ministers, ER personnel, doctors, nurses, defense attorneys. These are people that hear bad stories every, every day. day. Yeah. And, and uh, we empathize. You empathize with the person that's going. So you feel it too. Yes. So there's vicarious trauma. Mm. So all the people that knew Kobe, Angel, all the NBA players, all the players that he helped, you know, they're grieving as well because they're feeling the pain the same way as his, his family, yes. of, of course, to a different degree. Right. Yes. My goodness. Now, Dr. Tart, I remember a couple of years ago, um, Isaiah Thomas of the Boston Celtics, he yeah. suffered uh, a loss that was just as traumatic. His sister yeah. was murdered. Mm -hmm. And he had, they actually gave him time off to mourn. But what I find interesting is that when Kobe passed away mm -hmm. and his daughter, Gigi, two and, and one, um, who also played basketball, his daughter, um, the NBA c continued on with the games. What kind of impact does this have on the NBA players? And why do you think they were not allowed to grieve properly? At least for a day. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I consult with the NBA, okay. the NBA rookies. And so it's good to shed light on this, is that teams give players the option to play or not. There were, there were players that did not play. Okay. All right, they give them the option, and every team has a team doc, not only assigned to that team, but also one signed to the league and one signed to the Players Association. So the players have access to mental health probably better than any other league, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the world. So we have a very advanced mental health system. So they will allow the process to process it, talk about it, and the option not to play. We kind of minimize it when we see on the box score, did not play personal reasons. 
Mm -hmm. That's unheard of. If you're not hurt, you're not injured, they give them the right to be off if they're having a child, just not feeling mm -hmm. it that day as far as grieving. So they had an right. opportunity to grieve. But, but my concern is that some of the NBA players may not know what they're dealing with emotionally. And so at what point is it the NBA's responsibility to just say, listen, whether or not they know what they're gonna what they're gonna deal with emotionally, we need to shut this down. If nothing, if if, not, if for nothing more than to honor Kobe and his daughter, and but all you, of the people that were involved in that crash. Right, but you know, uh, being on the front lines, they're players that unfortunately deal with trauma, traumatic things every day. You know, a uh, victim of drive-by shootings, mm -hmm. mothers passing, dads passing, kids uh, being diagnosed with certain things. And so they have the opportunity to debrief. And I do know that each team was able to sit down with the players and offer them the services. Now, what they do on a league corporate site, of yeah. course, that's way above me. Yeah. But I can say from the mental health uh, that part, they were able, players have access to one of three psychologists on any given day in mm. every city and any country that they play in at oh any time God. that they want. 24-7. Right. We're going to take a quick break and have much more with Dr. Alderman Tart when we return. <laughs> Welcome back to the Sister Circle Live. We are continuing our much-needed conversation mm -hmm. with Dr. Alderman Tart. Yes. Well, let's talk about grief. Okay. You said that there are three P's mm -hmm. that complicate grief. Mm. Talk to us and talk us through these complications. All right. So you know how... Grief is, is incredibly difficult for everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one wants to go through grief and loss. But there's certain people that we all know that stay, seem to stay stuck. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's been a lot of time and they still seem like they're stuck yeah. in a particular phase. And it's usually because of three reasons, three Ps. The first one is personalization. This is where you feel like you had some personal Something you could have done personally. I should have had better doctors mm -hmm. for dad. When I went there, we should have sent him to the top cancer center, but I, I listened to the doctor, but it, it didn't feel right with me. And I should have said something. Or, you know what? When dad said he was fine, I should have rushed him to the doctor earlier. Mm -hmm. and, and so we all, a lot of times people do that as a way to try to bring them back psychologically. So when you have personalization, you can see how that complicates yeah, grief yeah, because yeah. you feel mm -hmm. like you had a part in it. Yeah. All right, number two is pervasiveness. We see this a lot of times when uh, like husband and wives and they've been together for a while and they have these uh, histories that that combine and they feel like my whole life is gone. Everything's going to be affected. I can't go to the same church because everyone's going to ask me about. I can't work out because we're in the gym. We can't be part of the same nonprofit organization. Everything. So my whole life is just pervasive across every mm -hmm. everything. I can't move on because right. everywhere I go reminds me uh, of him or her. Time. Yeah. You know, and then the third one is permanence. And this is where you say my life will never be mm, the same. I wow. never want to marry again. I never want to have kids again. This will affect me for the rest of my life. Mm. And so you can see how people that get stuck with the three P's have a difficult time moving through grief. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Jesus. Dude, and and, and grief is so personal to, because every experience is, is different. And I know particularly for kids, you know, as parents, when we see them hurting, um, like my daughters, they lost Cameron Boyce, uh, the, the Disney star, you know, and that affected them. Right. How do we help our children deal with uh, loss of, of, mm. of great big people or, or celebrities of, as well? Because they, they deal with it for a couple of days and then they move on with their lives, but I'm sure they, they right. grieve as well. We talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this thing in the, in the black community, be tough, be strong, yes, don't cry. Especially with boys. How are you so supposed fold. to be strong when you are grieving someone you love? That that is a mixed emotion. That's, true. Mm -hmm. All right, that's telling you, ignore your emotions, suck it in. If you can't suck it in, suck it up with a bigger straw. And that's how we have suicide up, depression mm -hmm. up, anxiety up, because that emotion has to go somewhere. Yeah. So as parents, we have to grieve in front of our kids. Oh, I do it all, all the right? time. We have to show them that, that it's okay to be sad about mm -hmm. grandma. It's okay to be sad about the loss of a job. It's yeah. okay to be upset and then be able to show them the emotions because we're modeling. They're watching us talking about being sad. So as men, this is something we, we have to mm -hmm. do. As women, this is something we have to do because our kids are watching. So let them grieve, allow them to cry, allow them to be upset. Don't yeah. minimize it. Don't right. say you didn't even know them. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Let them let them talk about it, express oh, I, it. I do it all the time. Yeah. They know when we're looking at a story or like a 30 for 30, mm -hmm. they always look at me, you crying, mommy? It's like serious, <laughs> but, I, but I want them to see me express emotion, even right. about people and stories that I don't know. So that's why they can cry and be open with their feelings. And I think that's a good thing. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Talk to us about the importance of self-care. 
Listen, if we don't have an active self-care program, then we're allowing the world to, to, to wear us down. So this is so, so this, Message. this goes out to everyone who's I, a helper or a healer. Mm -hmm. We just keep going. No one yeah. asks you yeah. how you're doing. I'm a psychologist do. and Hallelujah. a minister. No one asks me how I'm doing. Uh -uh. They never or even will. if they ask me how you doing, I'm fine. Well, let me tell you what's going on myself. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So you have it's to like have they, Do they really care? They don't really care. It's kind of just a preliminary to kind of get, get out what they want out. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been around a person who all they do is just talk about their stuff? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That All is, the time. It's not cool. Right. You know so what? we have to have proactive self-care. Mm -hmm. Dr. Charlie, you know what I would love to love to get your take on is when you talked about traumas, you know, kind of freezing at the peak. Right. Mm -hmm. What is it, how do we recognize that first of all? And then what is the first step that one would need to take to kind of eradicate that trauma or mm -hmm. at least try to work on healing? Mm -hmm. Allowing them to be able to talk about the trauma. All right, because it's going to come out in different ways. With kids, we see it with bed wetting, them regressing, Aww. grades dropping, aggression. We mm -hmm. can see it when you see a change of behavior in adults. They might start drinking or they might start being mm -hmm. irritable, withdrawal. All right, and so we have to be able to allow them to say, first of all, uh, life is traumatic. It's okay to talk about it. One in five people have been exposed to some type of trauma in their life, and those are the, just the ones we know that report it. That yeah. doesn't include right. the right. people that keep it private. So we have to have self-care. We have to talk about it, right. and we yeah. have to be able to express how we feel to be well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Some circumstances don't allow so you to grieve, though, mm -hmm. Dr. Chart. But we thank you for this much-needed conversation. But be sure to follow him on Instagram at Dr. Tart. That's with two T's. And